Ponder, a 100-year-old mystery that has only become more mysterious. Wonder if your biggest concern should be the sea monster or the giant birds. Contemplate whether the dangers of your job are worth the low pay. All these plus more weird history, strange science, and the paranormal. Draw the shutters and secure the landing. Brace for the pounding of a nor'wester. It's this week's suspenseful, salty sip of odd tonic. Welcome to the parlor. I'm Jennifer. And I'm Maxwell. The tea is hot. Your favorite seat awaits you. And if your schedule has been anything like <laughs> ours, dear guest, <laughs> our mutual getaway to the parlor is perfectly timed. <sighs> I know I'm not the only one who thinks the world just seems to be getting louder and busier mm. every day. Mm -mm. Wouldn't it be lovely to just pack up our microphones and escape to some exotic secluded location. Oh, that would be amazing. Maybe a treehouse nestled in a redwood forest canopy, maybe. Oh, or a fireplace in a stone cabin near a moor somewhere. Ooh. Or one of those lovely, lonely lighthouses out <gasps> on an isolated crag surrounded by a beautiful cerulean sea. So romantic and picturesque. Mm -hmm. Aren't the majority of those filled with ghosts? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> the artists and poets love to romanticize lighthouses, but for me, their charm isn't complete until you stick a good old haunting in there. <laughs> well, ghosts would certainly feel right at home in a lighthouse. Mm -hmm. Because as you know, despite their allure, they have often been the site of tragedy and lingering mysteries. And as you know, one of these mysteries has captured the imagination for nearly a hundred Hundred and twenty years. Do you think, my love, we should share with our guests the tale of the Flannan Islands Lighthouse? I think that's a wonderful suggestion. And I'm going to pull Keith McCloskey's The Lighthouse from the parlor shelf. This is going to be good. Off the west coast of Scotland are a series of over 60 islands called the Hebrides. The furthest of these islands, located some 40 miles off the mainland, are the Outer Hebrides. In the far northwest part of the archipelago, 17 miles away from its nearest island neighbor, are the Flannan Isles, several tiny islands and islets that are little more than exposed rocks, dwarfed in the vastness of the North Atlantic Ocean. Based on ancient origin tales, the islands are also known as the Seven Hunters. And the largest of them is Aelin Moor, which covers an area of 40 acres and sits at a lofty 285 feet up at its highest point. Though the barren environment does not make it remotely optimal for habitation, it seems that in the 7th century, Aelin Moor was occupied by Saint Flannan, a medieval Irish missionary and bishop after whom the islands are named. There still exists a chapel, a small stone room now in ruins, dedicated to him. From that time, and for hundreds of years after, the Flannans were understood to be a realm of the sacred and of the strange. The weather around the Flannan Islands can be foggy, stormy, and unpredictable. And in 1895, the Northern Lighthouse Board began building its newest and most remote station on Aylan Moor. The lighthouse itself was a clever piece of Victorian engineering designed by David Stevenson, a member of the distinguished Stevenson family of lighthouse engineers, and incidentally, the uncle of author Robert Louis Stevenson. Landings were built on the east and west sides of the island, allowing boats to dock no matter which way the strong winds were blowing. Crane platforms for loading and unloading cargo were built above each landing, 70 feet above the sea level. On the west landing, an additional crane was installed 110 feet up at the top of the cliff edge. 
Stairs zigzagged up from each landing carved into the steep 150-foot cliff walls, eventually leading to the island's grassy slope and a cable tramway system running on a concrete path. Powered by a steam engine in the shed beside the lighthouse, a trolley was employed to haul the cargo up the tracks from the east and the west landings to the lighthouse grounds. Construction lasted two years longer than originally planned due to terrible weather and rough seas. It was not until December 1, 1899 that the lamp, standing 275 feet above sea level, was lit, its beacon visible 24 miles away. The lighthouse was entrusted to four seasoned keepers who were rotated, six weeks on and two off, so that three of them were on the island at all times. 43-year-old James Ducott, husband and father of four, was the principal lightkeeper. On his arrival at Aylan Moor, he was already a veteran keeper with two decades of experience. The first assistant keeper was William Ross. The second assistant, Thomas Marshall. Third assistant was Joseph Moore. And in a standby role as occasional keeper was 40-year-old Donald MacArthur, husband, tailor, and old army soldier. Together, the lighthouse keepers found Aylan Moore's first year of operation to be a challenge. For one, nature wasted no time in proving, once again, who was truly in charge. Before the end of the lighthouse's inaugural month, a giant wave hit the west landing and washed away not only the lower crane, but also the upper crane at 110 feet above sea level. Only the lower crane was replaced. Additionally, two logs which had been stored in a crevice 75 feet up from the landing and weighing one and a quarter tons each had also been swept away by the sea. Six months after that, a powerful storm damaged the west side's landing tackle. Um, I think those two logs were only placed there for dramatic foreshadowing. What do you think? I mean, why, why are there two logs stored 75 feet up? I think we could look that up, but let's just keep going. <laughs> okay. Then there were the other non-storm-related incidents. In February, while operating the new crane, Thomas Marshall caused minor damage to it, resulting in Ducat, as principal keeper, in getting dressed down by a board commissioner. And alas, poor William Ross happened to be on the trolley when its brake failed and careened with it down the tracks, resulting in a broken arm. On December 7, 1900, James Ducott stood aboard the Hesperus, the steamer that had regularly been transporting keepers and cargo to and from Aylan Moor. With him was superintendent and friend Robert Muirhead, on his way to congratulate the keepers on their one-year anniversary at the lighthouse. Ducat was returning from his two-week leave and was in no doubt hoping that the coming new year would bring him and his men better luck. But signs were already dubious. The winter storms were fast closing in, and Ross, now recovered from his broken arm, had come down with an illness that became serious enough to warrant an extended sick leave. Donald MacArthur, the occasional keeper, was filling in. As Aylan Moore slowly came into view, Ducat and Muirhead could see the flying of the lighthouse flag, an official signal that the relief vessel was expected. With grins, Ducat's fellow keepers were waiting on the landing while another readied the crane above. Captain Harvey and his crew eased the Hesperus to dock, and soon all hands were unloading cargo and provisions. When the transfer was complete, Muirhead shook the hands of Ducat, Marshall, and MacArthur goodbye, and then he and the third assistant lighthouse keeper, Joseph Moore, stepped aboard the ship. Moore, who was taking his two-week leave, was looking forward to spending an early Christmas with his wife and two children, and as the Hesperus pulled away, he likely shouted he'd bring his workmate something festive and delicious upon his return on December 20th. But the sea had other plans. Storms lashed the flannons through the 13th and 17th, and only after a day's reprieve, a tempest, one that had the newspapers using the word hurricane, descended on the entirety of Scotland, hitting hardest on the 20th. It wasn't until the 26th 
Boxing Day, that Captain Harvey deemed it safe enough to bring relief to Aelin Moore. It was around noon when the Hesperus gained on the island, and the first thing Joseph Moore noticed was that the lighthouse relief flag was not hoisted. This was unusual, particularly since relief had been delayed by nearly a week. The general agreement aboard the ship was that the keepers had not seen the ship approaching, so the steamer's horn was sounded. No response. As they neared the landing, they could see that no crates were stacked and ready for loading. No lighthouse keepers stood to greet them. The ship fired a signal rocket. Again, no response. After a second horn blast was left unanswered, Captain Harvey lowered a longboat and sent Moore, along with his second mate McCormick, Boy Master MacDonald, and other crewmen ashore to investigate. As the little boat approached the east landing, Moore stared up at the lighthouse with gnawing concern until it was eclipsed by the island's imposing cliffs. The longboat backed into the landing and, with some difficulty, Moore managed to jump ashore. He raced up the stone steps and up the concrete path to the station entrance gate. It was closed. He unlocked it and ran to the lighthouse entrance door leading to the kitchen. It too was closed, but not locked. Once inside, he found that the inner door which led into the kitchen was open. In the kitchen, the air was damp with chill, the fireplace having not been lit for days. All the clocks had run down. The cot's sea boots and waterproof coat, as well as Marshall's sea boots and oilskins, which were worn on the landings for protection against poor weather, were missing. MacArthur did not have such protective outerwear, owning only a wearing coat, which oddly was found still hanging on its peg. With growing anxiety, Moore went into the rooms of each keeper. The beds were empty. At that point, he became alarmed and made his way back to the East Landing. He informed McCormick that the lighthouse station was deserted. McCormick and a few other crewmen managed to jump ashore too, and with more, made another sweep of the island. It appeared that all three lightkeepers had vanished without a trace. After returning to the Hesperus with their report, Captain Harvey told Moore that he would have to return to the island and keep the light going and wait for further instructions. Harvey called for volunteers from the crew to assist. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> Moore left with three volunteers to tend to the light, while Captain Harvey returned to the nearest town with a telegraph machine and alerted the NLB secretary of the disaster. I can only imagine what Moore was feeling at this point because he was familiar with the island, he worked at that lighthouse, and his three friends and co-workers were missing. Yeah, it was like stepping into the twilight zone, I'm sure. Yeah, and then here you go, just keep it going. Right. We'll be back. Everything's familiar and yet completely Com surreal. Eerie, yeah. Moore and the crewmen on the island made a thorough search, and three days later, Superintendent Muirhead joined the investigation new details came to light. While the east landing was in order, the upper part of the west landing was not. Iron railings of the trolley tramway had been lifted from their foundations and broken in several places. Near the top of the landing steps, a wooden box holding ropes and crane handles, which had been secured in a crevice in the rocks, had been displaced, its contents strewn and twisted. A large block of stone, weighing upwards of one ton, had been dislodged from its position higher up on the cliff and dropped onto the concrete path leading from the terminus of the tramway to the top of the steps. A life buoy fastened to the railings along the path was missing, but looked to have been torn away, not purposefully untied. Muirhead reported at the official inquiry, quote, after a careful examination and weighing all the evidence which I could secure, I am of the opinion that the most likely explanation of the disappearance is that they had all gone down on the afternoon of Saturday, the 15th of December, 
to the proximity of the west landing to secure the box with the mooring ropes, and then an unexpectedly large wave swept them away with a resistless force. Muirhead's hypothesis, commonly referred to as the giant wave theory, is the most popular explanation among those pondering the fate of the three men. However, nearly 120 years later, there are still lingering questions. For instance, it's against NLB regulation for the lighthouse to be unmanned. At least one of them should have remained inside. Any experienced lighthouse keeper knows that there is no rational reason to risk your life outside during a severe storm. There are plenty of tasks to be done inside, out of the elements. Why was MacArthur's coat still hanging on its peg? No bodies were ever recovered, nor any article of clothing. Could it be that Muirhead got it wrong? Is it possible that something stranger and more sinister became of the brave light keepers. When we return, the mystery of the Aelin Moor Lighthouse gets more mysterious when we dive into details that have come to the surface since Merhead's report. Intriguing details, including lost logbook entries, curses, sea beasts, abductions, and facts that point to good old-fashioned murder. Don't get lost at sea. Odd Tonic will be right back. Do you remember life before Odd Tonic? Perhaps you wandered endlessly upon a widow's walk, destitute as you scanned the fog-covered sea for your love, now five years missing. Only for your cries of longing to join those of the cruel and dispiriting coastal winds. But now you're here with us in the parlor, the firelight warming the cold from your old sea bones. Delightfully partaking in more strange conversations than you could have ever yearned for. Be a beacon in the dark for others to find their way. Share the podcast with loved ones and spooky friends. And write us a kind review on iTunes. Building our audience keeps this odd little podcast afloat. If you haven't written us a review yet, please consider doing so. And as always, you can follow us on Twitter and Instagram and like us on Facebook, all at Odd Tonic Society. As well, support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash odd tonic. Now let's return for more murky mysteries of seaside suspense. Welcome back. So far, we've shared the baffling early 20th century disappearance of three keepers of the Aylin Moore Lighthouse, James Decott, Thomas Marshall, and Donald MacArthur. Could it be that a giant wave swept the poor men away from their post? Evidence is certainly there to support this idea, But what about the other theories that have kept people debating this story for 120 years? Let's investigate together, dear guest. The Flannan Isles, and indeed the very island of Aelin Moor itself, has been understood to be an otherworldly realm for centuries. At the end of the 1600s, an antiquarian named Martin Martin wrote a book describing the folklore and traditions of the Hebrides, including the Flannans. The results are utterly fascinating. When speaking with a man who traveled to the Flannans often, Martin asked the man if he prayed at home as often and as frequently as he did on the Flannan Islands. The man admitted that he did not, saying that the islands were innately sacred, that whomever stepped foot upon them found themselves more disposed to devotion there than any other place on earth. Certainly, St. Flannan's 7th century retreat on Aelin Moor explains much of the reverence, but it seems that the recognized ethereal nature of the island may date back even further. According to Martin, locals described old tales of how several small bones were dug out of the ground on Aelin Moor. Quote, bones resembling those of humankind more than any other, which is why old names for Aelin Moore include the Isle of Pygmies or the Isle of Little Men. And the oddities don't stop there. Martin learned of peculiar customs and rituals performed during annual hunting parties where men of the island of Lewis would sail to Aelin Moore in search of its various seabirds. 
the rituals had to be strictly obeyed in order to avoid inconveniences during the hunt. Their first rule was to approach Aelin Moor by sailing with an eastern wind. If the wind happened to change to a westerly, they would hoist up sail, turn around, and just go home. If welcoming winds got them to shore, they would all uncover their heads, make a turn in an east-to-west fashion, and thank God for their safety. From there, the visiting hunters would approach the ruins of St. Flannan's Chapel, and within twenty paces of the altar, all would strip themselves of their top clothing and pray three times before they began the hunt. First, they'd pray and approach the chapel on their knees. During the second prayer, they'd go around the chapel on their knees. And the third prayer is the morning service, which was done inside the chapel. Further, it was absolutely forbidden to kill a bird with a stone. It was also unlawful to kill a fowl in their roosting area or after evening prayers. They must not call any of the Flannan Islands by name, but only refer to them as the country. And incidentally, St. Kilda, an island 47 miles to the south, was only to be called the High Country. And there were several other things that could not be referred to by their common names, such as water, rock, shore, cave, sour, slippery, etc., but had to be described by words in very old Gaelic. Why all these curious superstitions? Did it have anything to do with the legends of the tiny skeletons found on Aelin Moor? Were the hunters, very cautiously, trying to respect ancient laws maintained by the island's fairy folk or nature spirits? Throughout the 20th century, many books and articles written about the vanishing lightkeepers of Aelin Moor have determined just that. Several new details surfaced in these authors' works, including stories of how modern ways and beliefs destroyed the peaceful pact between humans and these little people, and how the three light keepers dearly paid for man's insurrection. In Carrie Miller's book, Baffling Mysteries, in 1976, she writes, The local people, who knew more about the history of the Flannans than did the investigators, have a different theory which continues to be passed down from generation to generation. They say that an unseen force on the island of Aileen Moor could not tolerate intruders and got rid of them. They say that when Joseph Moor flung open the door of the lighthouse and called out the names of his friends, three enormous black birds, the likes which have never been seen before, launched themselves from the top of the tower and flew out to sea. She leaves us to wonder, did these birds steal the men away? Or were these birds the keepers themselves, magically and hideously transformed by the unseen forces? Other proof of fairy vengeance was seen in what some people believe to be a curse that befell many connected to the lighthouse. For instance, at the end of its construction, the clerk of works, Mr. Dees, died suddenly. A year later, the three lighthouse keepers disappeared. On the night of the disappearance, the Archter, a ship that passed the lighthouse during the night of December 15th, noticed that its light was not burning. The captain made note to report the incident once port was made, but not 48 hours later, the Archter hit Carfi Rock and was severely damaged. Limping to port, the captain forgot to report the lighthouse in a timely fashion. Then, the Archtor and her entire crew disappeared without a trace around January 4th, 1912. On August 20th, 1904, one of the men who replaced the missing light keepers fell from the Aileen Moore light tower and was killed. And William Ross, the light keeper whose sick leave saved him from vanishing with his friends, suddenly dropped dead a year and four months to the date of the disappearances inside another lighthouse. <sighs> if only we continued to honor the little people of Aelin Moore the way they had in the past. With human sacrifice! 
As John Mitchell explains in his 1967 book, the disappearance of the lighthouse keepers may have been an extraordinary reflection of an ancient sacrificial ceremony. In the old pagan ritual, men were ferried to Aelin Moor, where they were installed in a sacrificial tower and taken by the gods. The parallel, seen easily, is that the keepers went to Aelin Moor, were installed in a tower, the lighthouse, and then disappeared. Magical little people and being taken by the gods. That sounds a little bit like extraterrestrials, doesn't it? Indeed it does. And it probably won't surprise our guests to learn that the name of Mitchell's book was The Flying Saucer Vision. Further, he was not the only one who believed that alien abduction was the answer behind the mystery. Michael Harrison, in his 1981 book, Vanishings describes the lightkeeper's presence on the island as offensive to the island's sky folk, and the lighthouse, which reached into the sky, disturbed the sanctity of the island, and the lightkeepers paid the price. But why, though? (laughs) (laughs) Because this lighthouse story wants to point fingers at everything, (laughs) including the sky. But these theories of the Keepers meeting a supernatural or paranormal fate seems a little less of a stretch when you learn of the weird cryptic logbook entries written by second assistant Keeper Thomas Marshall. Entries that allude to turmoil, drama, and fear among the men right before they vanished. In an issue of Strange True Stories from 1929, Ernest Fallon cited English sources when he recounted the logbook's last peculiar entries. December 12, gale, north by northwest, sea lashed to fury, stormbound, 9 p.m. Never seen such a storm, everything shipshape, Ducat irritable. 12 p.m., storm still raging, wind steady. Stormbound, cannot go out. Ship passed, sounding foghorn, could see lights of cabins. Ducat quiet, MacArthur crying. December 13th, storm continued through night. Wind shifted west by north. Ducat quiet, MacArthur praying. 12 noon, gray daylight, me, Ducat, and MacArthur prayed. December 15th, 1 p.m. Storm ended. Sea calm. God is over all. These final statements certainly fire the imagination, and since their publishing, they have been the focal point of most material written about the Keeper's mysterious disappearance. Author Vincent Gaddis notes, The men could hardly have been swept away by the storm if there had been one, for according to the log, the storm had passed when the last entry was made. The storm was over and peace had come. He adds, Ducat, usually very good natured, had just returned from his leave on shore. Why should he be irritable? MacArthur, well known as a lusty, fearless brawler on land, crying. What could have been the mysterious, extraordinary situation that would make strong MacArthur weep? Truly, what left these men, who were no stranger to sea storms, terrified and praying together before vanishing? Supernatural unseen forces? Giant birds? An alien menace? How about a horrific sea beast? Sea monsters have historically been reported on numerous occasions off the coast of Lewis Island. One notable sighting took place in 1882 when the crew of a German ship reported seeing a giant sea serpent approximately 131 feet long with a series of bumps along its back. Could it have been the descendant of the Beast of Stronzi? The beast was first sighted on December 25, 1808, lying on rocks on the southeast of the island of Stronzi. On that day, a local man, John Peace, was fishing off the coast when he noticed what appeared to be seagulls feasting on an animal's carcass. 
he turned his boat to investigate. He found a very strange looking creature unlike anything he had seen before. The scene was also observed by another Stronzi inhabitant, George Shearer. The creature was of a large serpent type with a long eel-like neck and three pairs of legs. Shearer measured it to be exactly 55 feet long with a neck that was 10 feet and three inches long. The skin was gray and rough, although if the skin was rubbed from the head down the back, Quote, it was smooth as velvet to the touch. Shearer described the head of the beast as similar to that of a sheep, and the eyes were bigger than a seal's. A bristly mane of long, wiry hair that grew down to the tail were said to glow eerily in the dark. <laughs> we love accounts of mermaids and other strange sea creatures, and we're happy to add this one to the mix. But I'm not certain of all the crazy ideas discussed. I'm going to go with a giant sea serpent eating all the men. <laughs> oh, no, I'm there. I, I think that was definitely the solution. I think that, What gave it away? <laughs> I think it was the giant uh, fork and knife <laughs> left on the West Landing and the giant sea serpent-sized lobster bib. I think the, I think the investigators really missed, uh, missed those clues. <laughs> How did they miss the giant toothpick? <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's slowly take a step or two back away from the swirling vortex of supernatural possibility <laughs> and look at a more earthbound explanation to the bizarre logbook entries, mania and murder. We romanticize lighthouses, but the lives of its keepers were comprised of tedious daily duties and plain hard work which was rewarded with the mental challenge of social and emotional isolation. Additionally, regulations were so strict that one man couldn't take a walk outside without another having full control over his ability to do so. Add close quarters to the routine, and tempers or grudges could easily fester, or completely unleash a mostly dormant mental illness. Many writers theorize that one of the men went crazy murdered the other two, and subsequently ended himself by jumping off a cliff into the ocean. Some blame Marshall, pointing out that his log entries, in a log book that should have been updated only by the principal lightkeeper, go against the practice of logging only weather and sea patterns, and reflected a troubled mind. Also, why was he writing it? Perhaps Ducat was unavailable to write it himself. <laughs> Others suspect MacArthur, who, it is said, had a terrible temper. Certainly, there was precedence before and after the disappearances. At the Aylenmore Lighthouse in 1939, one of the light keepers had a mental breakdown while another was sick with the flu, and the other remaining keeper had to overpower the out-of-control man and tie him up. The light keeper believed full well that the murder scenario was a real possibility. In 1960, two men visited the Little Ross Island Lighthouse to find one keeper there murdered in his bed, and the other was later found and arrested in Yorkshire. Even if the vanishing of the three men wasn't attributed to murder, the theory that MacArthur became unhinged and ran outside without his protective coat while the other two bundled up and tried to recover him isn't a large reach. Although there are even more theories we could discuss, we should probably quit while we're ahead, or behind as it were, because nearly everything we've discussed since the break, all these suppositions from the last hundred years are just complete hogwash based on fiction and misinformation. Mm -hmm. And we all have Mike Dash to thank for finally sorting it all out. A British historian, author, and a contributing editor to the Fortean Times, Dash comprehensively researched the Aileen Moore Lighthouse mystery and published his findings in a paper called The Vanishing Lighthouse Men of Aileen Moore. And really, we have his paper to thank for nearly all of the content during the second half. <laughs> and by accessing the archives of the Northern Lighthouse Board in Edinburgh, Dash was able to separate fact from fiction and prove that the mystery really isn't much of a mystery after all. The strange cryptic log entries, completely fabricated by a pulp magazine writer, 
The tales of fairies, sky folk, black birds, and human sacrifice? Also fabricated. In fact, it might be easier to address the stories that are true. All of Martin Martin's folklore details are unquestioned, including the bird hunting rituals and the local tales of small skeletons on Aileen Moor. But the isle is not reputed by locals to be a fairy stronghold, and no archaeology dig ever confirmed the existence of the bones. The unfortunate events and the deaths that occurred within the first four years of the lighthouse's operation are all true, as is the account of the beasts of Stronzi and the successful and attempted lighthouse murders. The rest are flights of fancy. The truth is, in the case of the Aylenmore disappearances, we don't require unusual explanations. The realities of working on a tiny, barren island in the middle of the North Atlantic are unusual enough in their brutality. And no one knows this better than lighthouse keepers and their superiors. Keith McCloskey, author of The Lighthouse, said, One lighthouse keeper told me the wind could be behind the disappearance of the men. He was 16 stone and carrying a fridge one day, and the power of the wind lifted him and the fridge and carried him about 30 feet. He thinks the wind took them over the wall of the lighthouse, which is very close to a 300-foot drop, end quote. In fact, powerful wind was Superintendent Robert Muirhead's first theory back in 1900. He later changed his thoughts when he learned that the wind was westerly on December 15th, which would have blown the men back to land had they been near the west landing, as he believed. But if the men had actually been at the east landing, powerful squalls may have taken them to the sea. Let's also not forget one year prior to the men vanishing, almost to the very week, a huge wave had been powerful enough to wash away two loading cranes, one of them 110 feet above sea level. A wave of that size could have easily overcome the men at the top of the cliff near the west landing stairs. The truly scary fact is that waves of this magnitude are hardly unusual in the Flannan Isles. Walter Eldebert who served as principal keeper on Aylin Moor between 1953 and 1957, observed that, quote, even the lamp house, 300 feet up, can be splashed with spray, unquote. Convinced that giant waves could account for the disappearance of his predecessors, he repeatedly took a camera out in bad weather conditions to record the height of the largest waves striking the island, exposing 30 reels of film in total. On one occasion, while crouching on the shoulder of the island some 200 feet above sea level, he himself was nearly washed off the cliff. Hmm. As if we need any more convincing, lighthouse keeper Jack Ross was stationed at Aylin Moor when he encountered something very similar. One day when he was walking down by the west landing, a giant wave appeared from nowhere, as he later put it, and hit him and his two fellow keepers. They were fortunate that they had seen the approach of the wave, but despite this, they did not have enough time to gain height and get out of its way, so they grabbed whatever support they could to gain purchase. Ross stated that the wave hit them like the proverbial brick wall. It was Ross's firm belief until his dying day that had the three of them not managed to grab hold of various supports, there would have been another Flannan Isles lighthouse mystery. There leaves only two real questions remaining. First, What on earth had the men outside the lighthouse, risking conditions like these? Although it seems everyone the world over has their own answer, the most insightful one came from James Ducat's own daughter. The Times interviewed Anna Ducat in 1990 when she was 98 years old. Anna had recalled that six months prior to the men's disappearance, the NLB had fined her father and Thomas Marshall for the damage the storm had caused to the West Landing tackle. The NLB said the damage was caused by negligence. Understanding the power of the wind and the sea on the West Landing, it could be argued that their assessment was bullheaded. (laughs) Our opinion, not hers. <laughs> Nonetheless, if this was weighing heavily on James and Thomas's minds, it probably prompted them to risk adverse weather and verify that everything was secure or to start making repairs. 
And when we remembered Ducat's first year at Aylenmore, the lost cranes, the washed away logs, the damaged tackle, Marshall's minor damage to the new crane, the failed break and the tram accidents, we can understand where his mind must have been. Another incident involving damage or loss to NLB property was not something that either Ducat or Marshall would have wished to see, with almost certain penalties for more supposed negligence. The penalties may have been more fines or even demotions. And the last question, what might have gotten MacArthur out the door without his coat? Camera-toting Aylin Moore lightkeeper Elderbert has the best theory. He said, while I was on Flannan, I would often sit there, putting myself in the place of the principal. A storm is raging, and Mr. Ducat is worried about his landing ropes. Nobody goes out of a lighthouse in bad weather, but if he loses his ropes, relief may be impossible, and he must save them if he can. After dinner, the wind starts to drop, leaving the cook to wash up. He and the other man put on their sea boots and coats and make their way to the west side. They come to the safety path, which has a handrail reaching the path which runs at right angles to the stairway and, seeing the path dry, they continue towards the crane, where the box for stowing the landing ropes is situated. Suddenly, a wave comes and sweeps one of the men into the sea. Elderbert then speculates that the survivor, whomever he may have been, then ran back to the lighthouse to get the help of MacArthur. With alarm, the cook rushes out without his coat, Grabbing a heavy line, the two men make their way back to the west side, hoping to throw the line to their unfortunate comrade. Then comes another huge wave, sweeping both men into the sea. One hundred twenty years has passed since that fateful day, and outside of the lighthouse becoming automated in 1971, very little has changed on the Flannan Isles, a tiny patch of rocks, dwarfed in endless sea. I think it's amazing how many supernatural elements you can discover when you start turning over proverbial rocks looking for answers. Hmm. And that's just it. People want answers. I don't know isn't acceptable in human nature. And sometimes they'd rather be satisfied with a wrong answer than leaving a blank space. People just hate I don't know. Yeah, but it seems that we did know <laughs> 300 years ago. You remember the Aylin Moore bird hunters? Mm -hmm. If the wind was westerly, they would turn around and go home. The west winds were then and are now mm -hmm. a monster in the flannins, apparently. But that knowledge got lost. Because it's boring. <laughs> Bored now. People would rather tell crazy stories and and we could still tell some of them, like the devil himself was to blame, or that people can still hear Ducat, Marshall, and MacArthur's names being screamed during storm winds around the island, or the ghost pirate ship theory. But we won't. Oh. Because it would all end in madness. Ooh. <laughs> 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 we hope you've enjoyed this mysterious romp through a disorienting fog of unanswerable questions. <laughs> Remember to subscribe so you never miss a show and consider supporting Odd Tonic on Patreon. Patreon.com slash Odd Tonic gives us the means to keep growing and cultivating the Odd Tonic experience. So keep that in mind. Until then, we'll be back next week with more weird history, strange science, and the spookiest paranormal perplexities we can unearth. This is, dear guest, goodbye for now. But remember, if a midnight venture ever takes you out to a desolate, windswept island in search of truth, and instead you find perched upon the rocks large black forms waiting to carry you off, to the realm of the dark fae. Don't worry. It's just us. Good night.